We are very pleased this evening to be able to welcome you to another monthly program presented by the Rhinebeck Historical Society. My name is Mike Frazier. I'm one of the board members, and I have Jeff Christensen and David Miller co-hosting with me. Um, you know, one of the... Rhinebeck is in Dutchess County, and Dutchess is a large county, has very important history, and a very important step forward in preservation of local history took place here uh, in 2012, uh, when the county executive finally decided to fill a position that had been vacant for a number of years, and that was a position of county historian. Um, and the person who was selected to fill that was Will Tatum, who's uh, just celebrated a few weeks ago. I believe it would have been his 11th year as a county historian. It's been, uh, you know, he took the bull by the horns, worked with our municipal historians and local historical societies to help us recognize and promote uh, <clears throat> little appreciated gems in our communities. And it's no surprise. So tonight that our speaker, um, you know, is somebody who's already familiar to many of us who are interested, not in just the county's history, but in Rhinebeck's history. I was just over in Millbrook uh, a week or 10 days ago when Will was presenting a program about the history of the poorhouse in uh, the county poorhouse, which was located in Millbrook. And that, I believe, was the uh, 12th time he had made a presentation to the Millbrook Historical Society. And this is not the first time that he's been here in Rhinebeck. And in, in March of 2017, he joined uh, our town historian, Nancy Kelly, who's with us this evening in a talk about prohibition in Rhinebeck. Uh, and that fall, using uh, Dutchess County's ancient documents as a source, he spoke to Rhinebeck Historical Society members about crime and, so yes, there was crime here in Rhinebeck, crime and society in Rhinebeck. Uh, and a year ago, he was here speaking about an historical treasure that runs parallel to 9G, hidden in the southeastern corner of our town. And what was that treasure? The Palatine Hamlet of Wurttemberg. Uh, there was hardly enough time that particular evening to do more than provide an introduction. So this evening, we are very pleased that Will Tatum is able to return and give us a more complete picture. Well, Mike, thank you very much for that generous introduction. And thank all of you for joining me this evening on a really a exceptionally beautiful 82 degree uh, late October day. Not too many of those here in Dutchess County. I am going to attempt to share my screen. So everyone keep your fingers crossed for a second and you should see a PowerPoint presentation pop up and I will tell Mike or look to Mike to tell me if anything uh, untoward happens. But as you can see there, we've got uh, a layout from the map that started it all. You've got the hamlet of Württemberg there. And we are going to be taking a deep dive into the beginnings of the settlement of this area back in the mid 18th to the early 19th century. And I must uh, put out there first and foremost that this is a piece of continuing research that I'm looking into. So gathering new data all the time. So tonight's presentation will be an update on that research. By no means will it be the final word on this Hamlet. But before we get into the, the real core of the talk, I'd like to thank the folks who have made this presentation possible because any good piece of history really requires a whole team. And if you like what you hear here tonight and see here tonight, please think of these folks. And if there's anything you don't like, that's entirely on me. I'd especially like to begin by thanking the Town of Rhinebeck's Historical and Archaeological Preservation Advisory Committee, otherwise known as HAPAC, for bringing Württemberg and especially the Marquot Farm to my attention. Of course, Nancy Kelly has done generations worth of work over the decades. 
on Rhinebeck history and especially on Palatine and other German immigrants to the area. A big thank you to the Reverend Mark Isaacs of St. Paul's Lutheran Church of Rhinebeck, whose excellent book you'll see the cover of in just a little while, but that is available on Amazon. I highly recommend it for folks who want an overview of the Hamlet's history. Phil Otterness is one of my personal favorite historians of the Palatine migration to America, or at least the New York branch, because he is now working on a project on the uh, New Bern, North Carolina branch, and you'll see the cover of his book. Melody Moore from the Dutchess County Historical Society is here with us tonight, and amongst all of the many things that Melody has done to help me develop as a historian, she actually put me on to one of the new to this project sources that we'll be going over tonight that really sheds a lot of light on to the experience of folks who were living in Württemberg in the 18th century. And uh, that source is, of course, maintained in the New York State Library, to which uh, the New York State Archives provides access. I also want to call out the Henry Hank Z. Jones Collection at the Germantown Library. For those who don't know, Henry Jones is <clears throat> the foremost compiler of Palatine uh, geological records. I think he's got close to a dozen volumes in print, some of which were used for tonight's program. And thanks to Tom Shannon, the town of Germantown historian, you can now go out to the Germantown Library just over the northern Duchess border and see Hank's entire research collection for yourself. Historic Red Hook provided access to materials, as did the Rhinebeck Historical Society. Duchess County archivist Justin Mancini did a lot of the imaging that you'll see tonight. And then finally, of course, a big thanks to Brad Kendall, our county clerk, who is a staunch supporter of history. Without him, I would not be able to give you this presentation or do any of the other work that I do to promote and share Duchess County history. And so where did all of this begin? It began with this beautiful map that is currently in the possession of the Rhinebeck Historical Society. And um, the legend of the map is down on the lower right of your screen, but I have typed it out up top for you. So this is effectively a parcel map of not just the tracts that were owned by Morgan Lewis in 1802, but also surrounding properties. When Lewis was trying to get a handle on exactly what lots and uh, rents he was owed, because Morgan Lewis himself is a legend of Dutchess County history and really New York State history as well. Locally, he is known as uh, the resident of one of the earlier inculcations of Statsburg, a structure that unfortunately succumbed to fire later on after his tenure. But he participated in the revolution. He was president at the Battle of Saratoga. He was governor of New York. He was also attorney general of New York and had uh, an exceptional career. He married very well into the combined line of the Beekmans and the Livingstons, the descent of Margaret Beekman Livingston. And this is uh, our friend Morgan Lewis's portrait. <laughs> And in the very late 19th century, or sorry, 18th century, coming into the 19th century, circa 1790 into about when this map was made in 1802, Lewis and his wife had inherited a large parcel of Beekman holdings. So those property records go back to the 1750s, many of which, and earlier, many of which are not held by Dutchess County because while uh, Henry Beekman had title to the parcel, he kept all of uh, the, the land records himself via leases and only some of those were filed. So that's another area for continuing research is to see how Henry Beekman, uh, how his rent books line up to what we know of the, the area. But in that period in the late 18th, early 19th century, Morgan Lewis is transitioning many of these leases to essentially freehold because the lease system was going out of fashion. He was also trying to figure out exactly how big these parcels are, which, you know, affected the rent a little bit because there was a difference between the rent um, arrangements that said how large the lots were and then how large the lots actually were when surveyed for this map. But before we get into the nitty gritty of that, it has been a year, as uh, Mike has noted, since we last touched on Württemberg. So 
we're going to take a little bit of a refresher before we get into the meat and bones of tonight's presentation. So first, we'll begin very briefly with a review of the Palatines and early German immigration into New York, because when we say Palatines, it's not always clear exactly who we're talking about, where they came from, or in fact, why they came to New York. Then we'll move on to covering Württemberg itself, the hamlet here in, in Dutchess County, not the kingdom back in Germany. There are questions about that as well in terms of where exactly it started on the map of Dutchess County and when it came to its current location. And then finally, the real bulk of the new material we're presenting tonight is on those early residents of Württemberg. And we will be using the 1802 map as our guide to to the names of the folks, and then we'll be delving into some new material, courtesy of Melody Moore, to get a better idea of what life was like for these people. So who were the Palatines? Well, technically, Palatines come from the Palatinate. And if we go back to late 17th century, early 18th century Germany, it's not a unified state like it is today. It is a collection of city-states of Palatinates, which is a, a fancy word for an independent territory, of kingdoms, of bishoprics. It is still the Holy Roman Empire. The Palatinate is one of the Protestant kingdoms along the Rhine River. You can see it circled there. On your left, there is also an upper Palatinate that is further east, but that is not generally where the folks that we'll be talking about tonight came from. So the Palatines were Germans who were living in the Palatinate or surrounding regions, especially further south into the kingdom of Württemberg, who were generally Protestants, but not always. In fact, current research is suggesting that there might have been as much as a 50-50 division between those who attended Protestant churches and those who attended Catholic churches. And not all of the uh, Protestant Palatines attended the same branches of the Protestant faith. It gets very tricky very quickly. But in the early 18th century, a mass migration of these people took place for a variety of reasons. There were push factors due to wars between the Kingdom of France and various parts of Germany. There were pull factors such as the so-called Golden Book, which talked about all of the wonderful land of milk and honey that could be encountered over in America if you could just find your way over there. So tens of thousands of Palatine, really Rhineland Germans, first made their way up to London. And there, of course, the uh, English sort of welcomed them. It was kind of a big surprise to them that so many Germans were coming to visit. They ended up spending a couple of winters in tents along the Thames, which, considering this was still in the mini ice age was not the most fun experience certainly not something i would recommend and finally queen anne being the reigning monarch at this time said we need to to find something to do with the folks who haven't already given up and gone back to the rhineland some of them went to ireland but the ones we'll be talking about roughly tonight went to new york and that's uh, covered by phil otterness as well as other folks discussing all right why did these people go to New York and what did they do when they got there? So this is an excerpt, a detail from actually a map of New England, but it's one of the ones I like that shows Dutchess County in the early 18th century. And you can see at the top of your map that it is marked Palatine's town or camp. These were the Livingston estates. So you had East Camp on the east side of the Hudson River, West Camp on the west side of the Hudson River, it is a whole involved story about what the Palatines were supposed to be doing there, theoretically producing naval stores, what they actually did there. And then in 1712, when the group split up, some families went up to what is today Schoharie, others went out to the Mohawk Valley, and some came down to Dutchess County and settled on lands as leaseholders of Henry Beekman. And that's normally the typical Palatine story that we have. But there are a couple of wrinkles in that. One of the first is that this Palatine migration is a very specific event, but it is not the only event. German uh, immigration from the Lower Rhineland has not simply happened between 1709 and 1712. It is ongoing throughout the 18th century. And you'll see in the bibliography several excellent articles by our own Nancy Kelly that talk about how not only do we have Germans continuing to come in from Europe, we also have Germans coming in from other German immigrant communities in America. 
So sometimes uh, the Palatines here in Dutchess County send down to their comrades in Pennsylvania saying, hey, there's land available. Why don't you come up and take over for us? And then, of course, there are folks who come in after that initial Palatine immigration who themselves are not from the Palatinate per se. And that's kind of where we're getting into Württemberg. And they have a whole different story of settlement that doesn't involve hanging out with the Livingstons, trying to make tar from trees and all of that other fun part of the original Palatine story. So now we turn to an overview of Württemberg itself. And there you see the cover of Mark Isaac's book. I highly recommend that one. It is available on Amazon. It's a very good read. The Reverend went through much of the source material that is available, including material from the 19th century, and has put it all together for you in a very well-written, easy to read chronological format. So why Württemberg? Well, the Reverend George Neff, who preceded Reverend Isaacs in serving the uh, St. Paul's Lutheran Church at Württemberg, put it this way in 1873. So he was discussing writing a paper essentially on the history of Württemberg, which gives you an idea of how long this topic has been under consideration you know, back into the 19th century. He's talking about how the Palatines came originally down from East and West Camp, well, technically, specifically East Camp into Dutchess County, the founding of Lutheran congregations, which by the 1750s, there were four distinct Lutheran congregations in Northern Dutchess and Southern Columbia County. And that among these folks, as you can see in the quote there, there was this group of people who had come over from the kingdom of Württemberg, which is south of the Palatinate. Don't worry, we're about to get to a map on that. In Germany, who had shown up had pitched their tents in the so-called wilderness and uh, were set aside from the Hollanders, the Dutch, who dominated in the area as Württembergers, and that's where the name comes from. So if you look at this section of the 1802 map that's on the left side of your screen, and you look closely, I'm hoping that everyone has a big screen tonight, but if you don't, lean in a little bit, it'll be okay. You'll see the post road, which is today's Route 9, running through the middle of it. Up there where it says Janet Montgomery, you're getting into what is today the village of Rhinebeck. And then further south here, we where we have Stephanus Fraley, and you'll see that in the enlargement on the right side of the screen. That is our best guess about where the Wurzenbergers initially set up their church, at least. And uh, we have some information that I'm going to get to on that in just a second, but fix that in your mind. So... The Hyde Park town line is right at the bottom of that image there. So it's pretty far south. You have what is basically today Mills Cross Road here going on the south. And then, of course, the road over to Rhinecliff. And there are still remains of those grist mills and sawmills where the Rhinecliff Kill comes into the Hudson today. So if you're wondering, where is Württemberg? Well, here we go. On the left side, you have a map circa 1720 of the Kingdom of Württemberg. Up here on the upper left, the Palatinate is underlined. That's Mainz up there in the Palatinate. You start to get into Württemberg, the kingdom with Heidelberg. You've got Strasbourg here, Baden, which is today Baden, Baden. And if you go over to the modern political map, you'll see some of the same stuff. You've got Strasbourg here. You've got Heidelberg up here. So this whole sort of southwestern chunk of Germany is Württemberg. I doubt that all of the folks we might call Württembergers in 18th century Dutchess County came from throughout that area, probably more along the Rhine River Valley here, because much of this is mountains. And of course, the Black Forest, which gives us the best cherry cake, cherry chocolate cake on record. So where does our evidence come from for saying that, OK, Württemberg, the settlement actually started pretty significantly west, you know, maybe a couple of miles as the crow flies, but on the map of Dutchess County, a significant amount of space. Where are those sources? Well, we have the Reverend Henry Melcher Mullenberg, who was the head of the Lutheran Church in North America at that time to think. He came up in 1750 because of problems in those four congregations, courtesy of Johann Christophels Hartwick, who was their minister who had arrived in 1748. And Hartwick is his own multi-volume story of an adventurous and controversial life. 
but he was not getting along with his congregants. In fact, he was getting along with them so poorly that the head of the Lutheran church felt that he needed to at least come up and check out the situation. So he notes that uh, he arrives in September of 1750. He visits each of the four congregations. And as you can see from the excerpt there on September 17th, he visits the smallest congregation at a place called Statsburg, which is roughly still Statsburg today going into part of Southern Rhinebeck, about eight miles from Rhinebeck. He holds services there. And then the following day, he transfers his baggage down to the river and catches a boat back to New York City. And you can read his commentary there about how he did what he could to set a good example in Hartford's congregations to try to mend relations between the minister and his parishioners. But uh, things did not necessarily turn out as well as he had hoped, because a mere almost four years later, not quite, we have this document from the Dutchess County Ancient Documents Collection, and that's our court records from 1721 to 1889. This is part of an indictment for assault on May 21st, 1754, where four parishioners all testify that Johann Christoffel Hartwick, and this all took place in the northern most of the congregations, if my memory serves me correct, had beat and physically assaulted and indeed even used a horse whip, horse whip on uh, several of his congregates and beat them out into the road. He was indicted. He was brought to court. There is um, a, narr a narration entered against him in the court records. The issue was settled out of court, but this is pretty much the only example I can think of in Dutchess County history, at least in the 18th century, of a minister assaulting his congregation. That assault probably occurred well north of um, Württemberg at the location of the shared church between the Lutheran and the Dutch Reformed congregation. So this is a nice map that you can find in one of Nancy's excellent articles. It's more or less behind Rugi's today at the um, intersection of Route 9 and Route 9G. And to give you an idea of where that stands out, that church is no longer extant, by the way, but the graveyard is still there. You'll see it if you're going north on your upper right. It's a little bit more difficult to catch if you're going south on Route 9 out of Red Hook. But this gives you an idea of where that is geographically. This is the 1797 Thompson map, of which there are four distinct copies in four separate collections. This is the one from Bard University or Bard College, which I find particularly good because it has the most details of all four of the different versions of the map. But this is again, about 40 years after Hartwick and really 40 years after the founding of Württemberg. So you see up here that intersection, which of course was adjusted slightly when Route 9G was put through in the 1930s, but you have the German Calvinist church, which would have been probably the location where Hartwick assaulted his parishioners and drove them out into the road. Today's old stone church is noted here. Rhinebeck Flats is the modern village of Rhinebeck, and you'll see labeled here is the Low Dutch Reformed Church, the Reformed Church of Rhinebeck. And then the area we're talking about is circled up here in the upper right. This is Württemberg with its German Lutheran church in the center. And then if we were to look down here, it would really be down in sort of the lower right-hand part of the map where historians have placed that first church where uh, Mullenberg gave his sermon and uh, where parishioners also had a problem with Hartwick. And of course, for those who don't know, Hartwick College in Oneonta is actually named for Johann Christoffel Hartwick and his will. He gave a very generous donation to underwrite the establishment of a Lutheran seminary out there. All right, so we're going to take a, a somewhat closer look here, situate ourselves. Before we get to the 1802 map, the 1797 map is the most detailed earliest map we have of this area. Württemberg, even though it is not noted as such, is this settlement up here along what is today Württemberg Road. It is aligned, as you can see, this map is tilted so that north is to the left, south is to the right, um, east is at the top, and west is at the bottom. So the German church is at the center of this establishment, and then the settlement itself extends out 
north and south. There are some sort of crossroads here. They're not the classic Dutch or English four corners arrangement. But that's one of the things that we look at and that this map shows. When you look at Rhinebeck Flats, which is a pretty classic example of uh, Dutch or English layout, you have a very clear crossroads here. You've got a church roughly on one of the four corners. You'll have the Beekman Arms on another one. That's a classic English, Dutch form of settlement. The German settlements that we see, whether it be up at Old Rhinebeck or whether it be here at Württemberg, tend to be very linear. They are not laid out crosswise, and they usually have a church in the center of them. So now we will move on to the crux of tonight's presentation. Again, this is the 1802 map. We've zoomed in to Württemberg itself because the Morgan Lewis map shows basically all of Southern Rhinebeck. And uh, we've tilted it a bit so that you can compare it to that previous shot from the 1797 map. So same way, you've got your Lutheran church up here. You've got a Marquats uh, in evidence of the Marquat family being here. When we look here, the church is still in the center. It's rendered slightly smaller. We have Marquats to the south at the uh, southern end of the uh, settlement. And then we have some Wagers, Pulses, and finally, we'll talk about the Burgers at the end there, and Yakomenyi's Vlai. And I apologize for, I'm sure, butchering that Dutch. That's as close as I know how to come to that pronunciation. So if we flip that map up to the way it's actually oriented, Morgan Lewis being a proper fellow, made sure that his surveyed map had north at the top of the map instead of at the side of the map. You see again, Crumb Elbow Creek, which marks basically the division between what is today and was in 1802. Well, not technically in 1802, that is an update. No, yes, technically 1802, Clinton is 1788, but you have the border with the town of Clinton. You have what is still today Württemberg Road. You have the Vly. And uh, we'll touch on Vlies a little bit later. And then you have the layout of all of these lots. In addition, if you think back to the big version of the map, which is really tremendous, uh, a great physical artifact, down in the lower part underneath the title of the map here is a key that gives an account of the folks who are occupying these various um, plats. And also the real purpose of the map, which was to try to rectify the lease records, which would have been held privately. Those are not things that are normally on deposit with us at the county. In terms of how many acres does the lease say that this individual should be occupying, and then survey it and see exactly how many acres there are, try to figure out what the difference between those two numbers is and then just default to the actual number of acres that is being uh, that has been turned out in the survey. And at the very bottom, this key goes on for a rather lengthy period. It notes that unless otherwise stated on here, these leases are for perpetuity, they're forever. So you can see, for example, John Ostrom has a lease for three lives. Uh, there are a couple of others here that are mentioned, David Cookingham, so Cuckingham, because as uh, Mike was saying before we started tonight, there are some folks who look at their last names, think they're English, and then find out that they're actually Palatine German. While most folks might look at Cookingham and think that sounds extremely English, there you have the mid-Anglicization of uh, a German name into an English one there. But he has three lives. All of the rest of these folks have basically the least is for their family forever. The assumption is, of course, that they will continue paying rent forever. And that's something that's worked out throughout the first couple of decades of the 19th century in Dutchess County. For those of you who might have heard of the rent rebellions, especially the ones of the 1830s that most famously uh, had an epicenter in Andes up in Greene County, there are more peaceful resolutions to the whole, whole issue of paying rent down here, and those leaseholds are transitioned into freeholds. So what can we learn from all of this? All right, so there again is a close-up for those who want to see it about how the general accounting, what I call the map key works, where you have per survey, 
253 acres, but the lease is for 235 and a half. There's your surplusage, but we're going to stick with 253. And it counts all sorts of things. So here under the Marquats, for example, it counts their wood lot as a separate lot from their actual home lot. And then you see over here, those forms, that, those farms that are held under lease are forever unless otherwise expressed. So we have a new source that is brought in thanks to Melody Moore. And Melody and I meet every other week to discuss a bunch of interesting things that are always going on in Dutchess County history. And at one of those meetings back in 2022, Melody said, have you ever heard of the DeWitt family papers up at the state library? And I had not heard of the DeWitt family papers up at the state library. The state library has done an excellent job over the years of either accepting family donations and papers or back in the 1970s, purchasing them from um, manuscript dealers with the result that there's an outstanding amount of material up there, but the contents don't always leap out at you. And she said, well, I was looking at the DeWitt family papers. I saw some stuff about justices of the peace and court records. I know you're interested in that. And then I also saw some things about account books. And those of you who know me know that I really enjoy the material culture aspect of our history. I'm always interested in what people we're buying and selling in Dutchess County. So if you have court records, if you have store records, you probably have my attention. So I went up to, um, to Albany to the Cultural Education Center where the State Archives and the State Library reside. The State Archives provides access to anything that you might want from the State Library, but you have to request it through the State Library uh, website there. And I called up the ledger books from the DeWitt family papers. And, you know, these are unassuming volumes. This is volume A, which is the earlier volume, which we'll mostly be looking at tonight. And then this green covered and beautiful brass class volume B goes a bit later. Volume A ends around 1760 and volume B takes the accounts from 1760 on up into the late 18th, early 19th century. But when you open these up, you have what is called double entry bookkeeping. And I know a lot of people who look at double entry bookkeeping and say, oh my God, it's terrible. I don't find it too bad. It just means that you have to do math a little bit differently. How it works in the 18th century is this. So on the left side, you have some form of note that this is all the stuff that has been purchased on account. In the case of uh, ledger A, they call it debtor. In other ledgers, you'll see debt or debit. And on the right side, you have the credit, in this case, creditor. And the idea is that by the time the accounts are rectified, both of these sums all totaled up at the bottom should come out as the same. On the debtor side, you have all of the things that in this case, Michael Poltz, and don't worry, we'll be coming back to this in detail, has purchased from DeWitt because Peter DeWitt, among many other commercial concerns, ran a store and also issued credit. So these are things that were purchased from that store. And then on the right are the things and the cash payments that the customer would offer in order to clear his credit account. So we're going to combine that with material from the 1802 map and a couple of other sources to begin now to think about, all right, who are these people and what is their life like in 18th century Württemberg over there along Württemberg Road? So we're going to start at the south and work our way north. And the south gate of Württemberg is dominated by the Marquat family. And in fact, uh, a Marquat farmstead still stands in a much altered condition now at the bottom of Württemberg Road, where it transitions from being a public road to a private road. So remember, don't drive on a private road without the landowner's permission. But here in 1802, you had two lots. You had George Marquat's lot at the far south and then Johannes Marquat above. George Marquat, of course, has leased his uh, land there excuse me, to Johannes Marquat for those of you who are reading the red letters. But let's dive into some details. So George Marquat's lot was leased to Johannes on May 1st, 1791. It contains 212 and one quarter acres. So this is 
a sizable farm. It's not what one would necessarily call a, a commercial farm of the 18th century, but it's a step beyond subsistence. It's able to turn out stuff that can also be sold, for example, to cover your debts at the local store. When we step up a moment and we see from uh, Dutchess County Clerk's documents, this is one of the areas where we actually do have land records for the, the parcels here. And this is the indenture that was made by Morgan Lewis to uh, Johannes Marquardt in 1791 to formalize this lease transition of, all right, now Johannes is going to be paying for George Marquardt, Marquardt's lot. You'll see me have a lot of facial Olympics tonight with all of these names. The interesting thing for me that comes out of this document is it gives us an idea of what all of these folks are doing with these lots. So Johannes has his own, which we'll get to in a moment. And he also has this 200 acre additional. What is he doing with it? He is going to be farming wheat because that's what he's paying his rent in. It's 24 bushels of good, sweet, merchantable winter wheat. Tells you a lot about the availability of sugar in the 18th century if they think that winter wheat is sweet. But, you know, you make do with what you've got uh, where and when you are, as well as providing, uh, as you can see at the bottom, one day's work with a wagon, sleigh, plow horses, etc. So you're going to be paying your rent, at least in this case. That does vary across the county. But in this case, Morgan Lewis is looking for the old traditional rent payment in kind, physically with part of the produce from the farm itself, and then through labor exchange. So moving on, we then have Johannes Marquardt, his own lot right above. You'll see in red there, and it's noted down here for you, that the map notation says this is 204 acres and a half, leased on May 1st, 1768. And that's one of the real striking things about this map is even though it's 1802 and even though the whole point is to rectify the data between the old leases and what's being surveyed in 1802 we have all of this detail that is otherwise unavailable because as far as i am aware these lease records do not exist at least not in a form and in a place where i can access them so that right there tells you all right Johannes Marquardt has been in Württemberg at least since the spring of 1768. We're starting to, to push back towards that circa 1750 date that uh, Mullenberg gives us. And then, of course, the map key records that it's a 212-acre parcel here, and then he has a separate woodlot of 26 acres. And this was a point that was actually brought up in a conversation earlier this past week, which is by certainly the late 18th, early 19th century, if you were walking around Rhinebeck, if you, for example, ascended Burger Hill and looked around, you would see many, many fewer trees than you do today. Because across the 18th century, the town was effectively clear cut except for these woodlots. Why? Because you need wood for building materials to put your houses and your sawmills and your barns and your other structures together. Dutchess County is really a wooden built civilization, as it were, in contrast to all of the stone building that occurred over in Ulster County from a very early date. You're also burning wood to keep warm in the wintertime, to cook throughout the year for various other purposes. You're actually burning some of this in order to make charcoal. That's useful in blacksmithing operations and then over in Eastern Duchess and iron smelting and refining operations. So it is not unusual in 18th and 19th century Duchess County to see a woodlot as a separate piece of property associated because the whole idea is you can't destroy all of the woods because then where's the rest of your building material and your firewood going to come from? Now we get into the details of this new source. What does this tell us about life in 18th century Württemberg? So when we look at this, we see up at the top, Johannes Marquardt's debit account. And there's not a whole lot of meat here, to be honest with you. He's um, down for a side of upper leather. And upper leather is its <laughs> not all parts of the cow go equally into leather making. Upper leather is normally used for shoe production. So when I look at this, it immediately makes me think, okay, is someone on 
Johannes Marquardt's farm making shoes in 1757. So we've taken that 1768 date that's on the Morgan Lewis map. And now through Peter DeWitt's accounts, we've pushed the Marquardt occupancy back to 1757, at least the chief of the Marquardt's, Johannes. And uh, what is he doing to clear his account the next year in 1758? He's paying in cash which is another bit of a stumper because for those of you who have read or heard anything about 18th century British empire in North America, part of um, the imperial policy was to keep hard currency out of the colonies because if you have hard currency in the colonies, that means that they can buy things from people who aren't British. You can buy stuff from the French, you can buy stuff from the Dutch, the whole idea really is you want an exchange of trade where you buy stuff, manufactured goods from Britain based on credit for all of the raw material that you're sending back. In this case, all of the wheat and other farm products that you are selling down the river. <clears throat> Excuse me. But clearly there is some level of cash in circulation pretty early for Dutchess County that uh, Johannes Marquardt is using to pay off his debts. Highly unusual, not supposed to happen, but certainly not the first time we've seen something happening in 18th century Dutchess County that wasn't supposed to be going on. But Johannes is not the only Marquardt in this book. We also have Jury Marquardt, and I have not done, or Yuri, if you want to be German about it, I have not done a whole lot of research into the Marquardt family tree. That's another thing to, to carry on with future research. But we have Yuri Marquardt, who is in Rhinebeck Precinct, even earlier, at least in this account book, than Johannes. He's there in 1752, and he has a slightly more interesting credit and debt entry in this case. So first of all, you've got three and a quarter L of woolen checks. What does that mean? An L is actually an alternate to the yard as a measurement of length of cloth. Um, in the English tradition, it's something that the Scots use, but on the continent, they tend to use the European continent. They tend to use L's instead of yards. Woolen checks means checked woolen cloth. You can make all, so all sorts of clothing, um, bed woolens out of it. Uh, it's a very popular style of woolen fabric to be getting in Dutchess County in the 18th century. We see that from other account books. You also have a half pound of powder. What kind of powder? Probably black powder. That's normally what we see um, retail. Theoretically, it could be wig powder, but I don't think that uh, Yuri, who is noted on the credit side of the, the entry as a laborer, is very worried about powdering a wig or even his own hair. So it's probably black powder for hunting. Of course, rum, when you want to talk about alcoholic beverages of 18th century Dutchess County, rum is ubiquitous and uh, everyone's buying it pretty regularly. You've got more powder, a half L of shalloon, which is another woolen cloth. And then clearly phonetically spelled sleigh whip is probably the sleigh as in the, uh, the item that's used to get across the hills and dales of Dutchess County in wintertime when there's snow on the ground. So that's a pretty interesting assemblage of stuff, especially for a laborer. It runs the gamut from everyday things like rum and powder to woolen materials and a whip. And how is he going to pay for this? Well, if you look at the bottom of your screen there, you'll see that he too is paying in cash. So it's one thing to have a leading farmer like Johannes Marquardt paying in cash. It's really much more of a stumper to think about, okay, a laborer is paying in cash. Clearly something is going on here beyond our assumptions of how things worked in the 18th century British empire. And Yuri's account pushes our date even further back now from 1757 to 1752. We don't know for sure that he is in Württemberg, because this does not spell that out, this source, but we're about to get to some sources that do. So heading further up the road, our next stop are the Wagers, and they are still here with us today, but you can see that Michael Wager has a lot on the east side of Württemberg Road here, south of the church, but in the fine print of the George Poltz, a um, lot above him, which is on the other side of the church, even though it looks like the church is in 
his lot. It is not. It sits on its own piece of land that was actually deeded over to the congregation by Henry Beekman in 1759. And we have the land transaction for that down at the county clerk's office, if you ever want to see it. But here we have the notation that George Poltz's plot has been leased to Miguel, probably Michael Poltz, 1st of May, 1769. So again, we're pushing back 1802 to 1769. The map legend notes that we have one uh, parcel here of 94 and a half acres. And then if we look over here, we see another Michael Wager notation of 19 acres adjacent to the Vly. And we'll get again to the details of the Vly later. So he has two. Now, when we look at the work of Henry Z. Jones, who's, of course, charted both European and American records, he documents that there is a Leonard Vager in the Württemberg area in 1743. Now, I took that originally to be here in Dutchess County in 1743. It could be that that was back in Württemberg itself, because all of the names we're talking about tonight, if you do an ancestry search, for example, the Marquats, the Pulses, the Vagers, they all pop up in um, Lutheran church records back in Württemberg. So it's pretty clear that all of our conjecture about, all right, these guys are called Württembergers and their settlement is called Württemberg because they're from Württemberg is finally borne out. Now, for those of you who might have uh, taken note at the beginning, that map is titled the Wittenberg Trap. And thanks to um, a researcher that actually came and is currently visiting several of the institutions in Rhinebeck who came over from Europe. We have been advised that uh, Wittenberg was the Dutch uh, version of Württemberg. That's what they tended to call Württembergers. So that potentially explains why we have this difference in terminology with this map. But 1743 in Dutchess County, that's earlier than we thought for the establishment of this Württemberger community. But it is not necessarily surprising because we have other elements, including, I believe, some of Nancy Kelly's work that point to Germans coming up from Pennsylvania into our communities around about that time. So there's a lot more communication than most folks would probably suspect between the different German groups geographically spread across America. So what does the... Uh, Ledger A of the DeWitt papers have to tell us about the Vagers. Well, we have Landert Vager here, and he is, of course, noted at being not in Rhinebeck precinct, but at Yakiminye Vlai, date 1750. So that's right when the Reverend Molenberg is here preaching, but of course, Yakiminye Vlai is not over along the post road. It is uh, Basically, today's Route 9G runs right through the middle of it. It's the major geographical feature. And uh, you'll note today that you are driving through the Vly because you'll see the sign for Vly Road. So what does Landert Vager have to tell us about 1750 in the uh, Württemberg area? Some interesting purchases here. So 32 and a half pounds of deer leather. Seems like a lot of hides of deer. What do you do with deer leather in the 18th century? Well, one of the things you can do with deer leather in the 18th century is make the 18th century version of blue jeans, which are leather breeches, almost exclusively made out of North American deer hide to the point of when you might think of Daniel Boone crossing the Appalachians out into what is today um, Kentucky and Tennessee. He was a hide hunter, and he was one of a host of hide hunters that start going out there relatively early in the 18th century, because once this material gets back to Europe and folks start wearing deer leather breeches, they find that they're not necessarily always the most comfortable thing, but they are practically indestructible, very hard wearing, and everyone has a pair of them right on up to King George III himself. One of his pairs actually survives in the royal collection over in England. So perhaps the Vegas are turning out some leather breeches, either for their own consumption or to sell in the community. He's also buying pepper. If anyone tells you that they didn't have all of the basic table condiments in 18th century Dutchess County, don't believe them because we have a host of store ledgers in addition to this one that show that pepper is being purchased along with sugar. We also have nails. 
And it's rather famous that timber frame homes in this period are held together largely with wooden pegs. The framing timbers are, the siding not so much. Nail production is a thing that is going on throughout 18th century Dutchess County, and especially here in Rhinebeck, where there are a bunch of blacksmiths at work. You have brimstone that is used for cleaning. You have, of course, at least two installments of rum there testifying not only to folks needing a little something to take the edge off of 18th century life, but also rum had a variety of applications in the kitchen, particularly as a preservative. So just because you see rum being purchased does not mean that folks are having regular parties. It, it could mean that, but not necessarily does mean that the smaller amounts that we see in most of these purchases, ranging from a quart to about a gallon, though, suggests probably kitchen use there. All right, so what's the deal with the Vly? If you have looked at any of the 18th to really the 1840s maps of Dutchess County, you will see, especially here in Northern Dutchess, you will see Vly's all over the place. What is a Vly? I asked that to our Dutch researcher earlier this week. And she looked at me as though I had three heads, which is really not an unusual reaction when I ask a question. But it turns out that evidently this word is not in common usage in modern Dutch. It translates to basically a seasonal pond. So part of the year, you're actually going to have standing water for a pond. The rest of the year, you're going to have a marshlands, wetland situation. They're dotted throughout northern Dutchess and are frequently used as landmarks and sometimes as lot barriers. In this case, thanks to the 1802 map, we know why this fly has a name. It is named after the wife of Jan Elting, who has one of the earliest, and I miswrote it there, that is not January 27, 1789. That deed is from January 27, 1689. And that's freehold. This is a relatively rare example of an individual who is not a patentee, so he was not, for example, one of the nine partners that had tens of thousands of acres. He has um, 191 and three quarters right there, but uh, still has it freehold. He doesn't owe anyone any sort of rent except paying taxes to the crown, which are quit rent. And within his lot is this major defining feature. And if you go back and look at the big map of uh, the Morgan Lewis tracks, or you go back and look and we'll see it again, of the Württemberg portion, the Vly is the major defining feature. And that's why we see in his account that his location is being noted on the Vly, because he is uh, right over here near the Vly, the Wager lots, or at least. So that's part of what tells us that in 1750, you had Württembergers who were living where the Württemberg Road hamlet is today. They were not on the other side along the post road. There may have been a church there where they went to worship and to hear dignitaries like the Reverend Mullenberg preach, but they were definitely living up in Württemberg by the middle of the 18th century. So what is Vager paying off his debts with? Finally, thankfully, something other than cash, because while cash is beautiful and the DeWitts would certainly have preferred cash, just like everyone else in 18th century Dutchess County would have preferred cash. We, as historians, prefer it when debts are paid off in kind, because that then tells us, all right, what are farmers? Helpfully noted here that Lane Dirt, Vigor is a farmer in 1750. What are they making for sale? Because, of course, they're going to be raising subsistence crops to feed the family. But what form does the surplus take? And here we see black seed. Okay, why do you need flax seed? Well, for those who don't know, flax is what they made linen out of in the 18th century. Not hemp, but flax. And there's a whole industry of it, evidently, in Rhinebeck at the time. And Langdurt Vager is uh, raising flax for its seed itself. So he is not processing it into cloth, but he is giving it over to the DeWitts uh, for their own use. And we'll give some foreshadowing about that at the end of the presentation, because it could be that I'll be pitching... Uh, Mike and the rest of the Rhinebeck Historical Society Programs Committee an idea for next year. We've got flaxseed. We've got butter. So, so much butter all up and down there, along with some additional flaxseed. And we also have a young deer because, you know, some folks like the taste of venison. 
I hear it's uh, great as a substitute for steak and a Philly cheesesteak if you want to really slow cook it there. So clearly we have an agricultural situation and arrangement that is going well beyond that merchantable winter wheat that folks expect to receive in, um, for their rent. You've got flax, you've got butter, you've got some hunting going on, hence the powder that Yuri Marquat was buying. This is a diversified agricultural situation. It's not quite as diversified as it's as most of these farms might be by the early 19th century, but you've got a fair amount of interesting things going on here for the middle of the 18th century and what is not considered to be a terrifically developed part of uh, Dutchess County. Finally, we get up to the pulses because the pulses occupy large chunks of the northern part of the hamlet of Württemberg. And you can see the fly over here now. And remember that Michael Poltz is renting George Poltz's place at least by 1769, potentially earlier. And his own parcel is down here to the south. So near Yakominye's fly. The map notation here records John Poltz at least to Michael Poltz. They spell it Miguel, but it's probably the same thing. May 1st, 1758. So again, we're pushing back towards mid-century. The map legend pushes that from 193 and three quarters acres to 220 acres actually occupied, at least by John Poltz, technically. And again, this does not uh, necessarily take heed of who's actually occupying the property at the time. There's an associated woodlot of 37 acres, and then there's a split tract held by both John Poltz and the widow of Daniel Poltz. And that's more genealogical research that I'll be looking at as this project continues. Henry Z. Jones documents Michael Poltz at Württemberg, again, somewhere between 1739 and 42. And I'm sure that at the end of the presentation, Nancy is going to remind me whether that's Württemberg, Germany, or Württemberg here in Dutchess County. And I did look through the 1790 census, and it turns out, guess what? You've already seen, at least from the headings of the slides and the map itself, and then some of these uh, store ledger entries that, well, you know, folks in the 18th century don't like to spell their names the same way twice if they can help it, especially if it's, you know, all on the same side of a sheet of paper. So I have not been able to run the other families down on the 1790 census yet, but I was able to find a Michael Poltz, head of household with two white males over 16, three white males under 16, and three white females, no enslaved individuals. There is also noted on that same page of the 1790 census a Daniel Poltz, whom I am guessing is uh, a descendant of the Daniel Poltz, whose widow shared a lot with John Poltz. That individual is noted among uh, having among the other members of the household three enslaved individuals. So that is another factor of the Württemberg life that we will be exploring because pulses are not necessarily just in Württemberg. They're spread all over the place in Rhinebeck. But the fact that Michael Poltz and Daniel Poltz are on the same page of the 1790 census, we have a pretty fair idea that the census takers were going more or less door to door suggests that uh, Daniel Poltz is somewhere nearby. So what does the store ledger tell us about Michael Poltz? Again, we're pushing back towards 1750. In this case, 1752, again, near Yakame's Vly. So importance of the Vly there, not only is that geographical and determining feature, but also letting us know that, yes, there are people living up there on Burtonburg Road in the mid-18th century. Unfortunately, the store clerk got lazy, and we see this a lot in the ancient documents as well, where they just say things like sundries, which translates to sundries, goods, and merchandises. You see that on a lot of debt prosecution, which, like cash, is frustrating because you really want to know as a historian, what are these guys buying? But the 18th century people are telling you, I'm not going to take the extra time and the hand cramping to write all of this out for you. Those of us in 1752 know what we're talking about. We've seen it. So you guys, 200 years in the future, tough luck. But we can still pull some details out of this. So, for example, Michael is buying sugar. Yes, it is available here in 18th century Dutchess County. People are not reliant on maple production for a sweetener. You can get West Indies sugar at any of these stores. The rum, again, 
in two relatively small installments. So probably for kitchen purposes rather than uh, personal pleasure uh, consumption. But the half gallon of wine, that's an interesting outlier. You do see wine in 18th century Dutchess County, but nowhere near the level and the sheer quantities that you do with rum. And then what is he paying in? Okay, so, so far with our other accounts, we've seen cash. Thank you, Mark Watts, for not being helpful at all. We've seen the Vegas paying and flaxseed and butter and a young deer. That's pretty exciting stuff. I like that. How is Polt's going to pay? Well, you know, he tells his neighbors, hold my beer. We're going for the grand score here because I'm going to pay in cattle. That's right. So now we have evidence not only of a diversified crop raising. And, of course, the butter tells us that there are some cows out there. But there is a big difference between having a milk cow or three for your property and then paying your debts in fat cattle. Because fat cattle are for making steaks. And today, hamburgers, not for making milk. And that's probably what they're trying to uh, communicate with fat cattle for a cow there. I'm still trying to figure out and decide what they're trying to tell themselves, least of all us. But Michael Poltz has enough land and uh, enough gumption to raise cattle for sale, which is a whole nother step above. It probably testifies to the fact that not all of this land in that area is great for raising crops. We know that Slate Quarry Road exists there today. That's not just a euphemism. There's a lot of slate outcroppings up there. And that very quickly can translate into land that is better for pasture than it is for plowing and raising crops. So we're basically at the end of our presentation today. We've gone through the parts of the accounts that really pertain directly, at least that I can quickly trace to Württemberg. But just to forestall the inevitable question here, where is Burger Hill? So Burger Hill is up here then as it was today at the head of um, Württemberg Road. And it's named probably because even though it's on William Dietrich's lot, it is leased to Peter Burger. And of course, the Burger family are all through the other lots in this area, they just don't happen to be directly necessarily right on the core of the Wurzenberg settlement itself. And unfortunately, Peter Berger does not have any accounts that I can trace with Peter DeWitt yet, but it is something that I'll be looking into as research continues. Our bibliography continues to grow. You can see up there, Henry Z. Jones, even more of Palatine families. And uh, his first works were just titled Palatine Family. So this is several generations of work going on there. You can see Nancy Kelly's many excellent articles. This is just the tip of the iceberg of Nancy's enormous body of scholarship that she's generated over the years. And of course, her husband, Art Kelly. And if you look for kinship books, you'll see his work has really outdone himself with transcribing many of these 18th and 19th century church records, including the Württemberg church records, so that you do not have to squint and turn your head to the side to try to figure out what the reverend meant in 1753, because Art has transcribed it into nice print for you. You've got the full titles of Reverend Isaac's work, Bill Lauderness's work, all of our mortgage deeds, filed maps, and other materials are available at the Dutchess County Clerk's Office, and we are working to digitize those and make them available online. The Dutchess County Ancient Documents Collection, the stuff that we have processed at least, is available online now. We have just done a huge update. 167,000 pages of court filings are now available to you through keyword search. And of course, the biggest thanks of all to the Rhinebeck Historical Society, for preserving the uh, Morgan Lewis map and uh, letting me take a look at it and permitting the County of Dutchess to assist them by scanning it. So that is all for me tonight. Uh, that's how you can contact me. Email is always the best. You can find my government webpage there at the bottom, duchessny.gov forward slash history, has a variety of resources, including a great directory of local historians. And uh, thank you all. I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. And at this time, I will stop the share. Thank you so much, Will. And even though we have a magnificent uh, Morgan Lewis map, 
the credit goes to Will Tatum for arranging to have that scan for us. And we've had uh, a number of occasions where researchers like yourself will have taken advantage of that. And it makes a big difference uh, if you have artifacts like that. Uh, you know, they're not doing any good if you can't share them with others. And you have shared this evening some really magnificent uh, putting together these disparate parts. Uh, I was not aware of this ledger um, in the state archives. And Melody, thank you for having pointed it out to Will and Will for uh, drawing all these uh, details that tell us so much more and make Wurttemberg uh, much more lively a community. And now we know what was happening there, who was growing what, who was doing what with that land. Uh, it's, it's a much clearer picture of what's happening. And I assume you're going to be doing some more work with those ledgers. All right. I will. And and when you look at all three of them, and again, kudos to Melody, because they are not called out in the finding aid as like, hey, guys, look at this. They contain enormous amounts of exciting material. They are literally listed as Ledger A, Ledger B, <laughs> Store Journal. But a, a possible future topic, Mike, for the program committee to consider is the... Uh, the intricate web that Peter DeWitt wove throughout not just Rhinebeck, but the entirety yeah. of Dutchess County, because those three books, and remember, folks, we only touched on part of one of those books. It's a whole lot of data that shows that there's a lot more going on in 18th century Rhinebeck than I certainly expected. Yeah. Well, we'll... Uh... David Miller, who is responsible for putting together our uh, uh, scheduling our programs and lining up uh, speakers, is with us, I believe, still this evening. And I'm sure he's making note of your offer and that we will certainly be back to you. So, Jeff, I know you've been keeping an eye out for any raised hands or chat comments. Uh, and if uh, we have any of those, could you? Turn us over to those individuals. Okay, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Will. Uh, no, we don't have any raised hands yet, but just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, you can go down to the bottom of your screen, click Reactions, and click Raise Hand, and we'll call on you. Um, and you can feel free now to turn your camera on so we can see you. Um, if you have your camera on and you wave at us, we'll be able to pick on you. But also, um, if you just want to ask a question, I think now you might feel free to unmute your microphone and uh, and then go on ahead and we'll see if we can bring you in. Actually, Jeff, if we don't have anybody else, I'd, I'm always uh, seeing questions floating around in my head. I was, I, I'm amazed, Will, that we have a record of this kind of activity here that early in the 1750s. Um, and, you know, I, I would have expected at least, uh, you know, 20 years later, I know the original Wurttemberg Lutheran Church, as you pointed out on that map, was closer to the uh, Albany Post Road, the present Route 9, right around, we, we don't know exactly where it was, I guess, uh, but that it, around where the state police barracks are located today, at the south end of the four lanes, uh, right near the border of, of uh, where those four lanes come back to two lanes, right near the border with Hyde Park. Um, and I assume what it must have been because of the population growth up in that area that had already been growing that uh, that the church wound up establishing itself uh, where it is now uh, that 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 location down closer to the post road, even though you would think that all the you know whatever traffic was going on the post road would be an inducement to build your formal, your, the magnificent church that's there today to build it there, but no. Uh, and I, and 
what your documents, I think, show us is that indeed there was, uh, you know, the kind of activity that was going on there justified uh, moving uphill and moving uh, up to what we now call Wurtenberg Road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the work of multiple generations, as well as at this point, multiple centuries of Rhinebeck historians has suggested that that uh, that church and some of them do kind of put it in quotation marks that was down along the post road was probably not what we think of when we say church today, but more like a log structure or a barn structure on Peter Fraley's lands. And Fraley is an actual 1712 era Palatine because his lease is, is marked to at least 1719. And I'm sure that Nancy will tell us if it was earlier than that, because she is one of the few people I know who can actually read the Beekman rent uh, registers. But that was certainly a temporary-ish arrangement while uh, the folks from Württemberg were getting themselves set up a couple of miles to the east. It wasn't so far that they couldn't walk it, especially by 18th century standards, but clearly they were in some form of negotiation with Henry Beekman to, to get that deed to not just land for the church itself, but also a common, and then another uh, piece of land that was attached, not directly, but was across the Bly for the upkeep of the church. So basically a woodlot for the Württemberg Lutheran Church. But I was also surprised at how early this material was. Um. Jeff, jump in if if you see uh, or others have questions. Uh, I I can keep asking questions all evening here. I, well, I've actually, yeah. we don't, I'd we like don't to call any. on. I'd like to I call on go. Nancy Kelly because uh, I see that she has unmuted herself, and Nancy always has great things to say that give me a better understanding of the topic. So, Nancy, any thoughts you want to share with us tonight? Well, I think we should be looking more into the original um, the Palatine the Wurttemberg Palatines actually came to to the u s through Pennsylvania through Philadelphia, and then were encouraged to come up and be able to rent land here on the on the Morgan Lewis lots. Um, and so that they probably came in the night in the 1730s and then um, got up here to Rhinebeck fairly soon after that because of um, interaction maybe with the original Palatines that were already here. Excellent. Well, I'm, Do you know I'm happy to look at. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, no, I'm just happy to hear that Nancy supports my suspicion that there was a lot more communication between the various, you know, we call them Palatines, but really German because of the area that they drew from back in Germany. These groups that came over weren't just, all right, we're in New York, so we're not going to talk to anyone else. I suspect they were in pretty constant communication from the Hudson Valley down to Philadelphia and its hinterland, probably down to North Carolina as well. And you now as a result, we're talking about another example of how Dutchess County is part of a wider network, even that early in its, in, in its existence. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead, Mary, go ahead, Mary Ellen. <laughs> Hi, Will, I'm sorry. I missed the seven o'clock start of your talk. But, you know, I'm working right now on the, the Orange County Montgomery group of Palatines. And yes, everything you're saying, you know, it's sort of like that old joke about, you know, tell a woman and telegraph, tell a woman. Well, tell a minister. Because the ministers were going all up and down the Hudson from Philadelphia to New York. Yeah. And then up and down to all the parishes along the Hudson. And yeah, they were telling each other. And actually, right now, the, the Old Stone Fort in Skahari, they hired a fellow named um, Nate Hoffman to do just this, to, to, find, to find out and research the connections between all the different Palatine settlements. 
And that's what he's working on right now. And he's got, and you know, I, I, is it Weiser, Weiser? How do you say his name? I get that. I guess that depends if you're talking to a native German speaker or uh, an American. I've always heard it well, as Conrad Weiser. But, uh, okay. So he and one of the ministers just like a couple of short time before he died. So it was like 1760. They were traveling around and going over even to Ohio territory. And, you know, this whole thing was going on. They were communicating between all the different com communities. So, yeah, what you're saying is absolutely true. Excellent. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen. May yeah, I well, I'm Go ahead. I'm curious. You you say you're working researching the Palatines in Orange County. I mean, I was aware right. in Newburgh that uh, there was a group. No, that... Montgomery, Montgomery, and my big theory that I can't prove right now is that it had something to do with like why did the Palatines come to this lower part of the Hudson Valley? Um, which was had not totally different from the experience on the east side of the river. So on the west side of the river, they could be, they could do a lease, but then they could buy. And so they bought their farms very early on after being leasing for five years, 10 years, whatever the requirement was. And I think Francis Harrison was the connection because he had a patent here and he had a patent on the Mohawk next to Stone Arabia. So I'm just trying to, if I could even get one little sentence that said, yeah, there's the connection, that would be great. <laughs> Where he said, come here. And coming here to the lower mid Hudson Valley, um, these guys lucked out. Just get your farm, spend a little, you know, spend a little cash, guys, buy the farm. And all you got to do is farm. They weren't attacked by Mohawk Indians. They weren't settling in old land claims that were, you know, not proven and all kinds of stuff. All they had to do was farm. They had a good life. <laughs> when, when you say very early on, how, how early are you talking? Well, Harrison got his patent in 1720. And then I don't have the, the 1735 document giving deeds to the Palatines that were starting to get ownership deeds, 1735, but they were already here because the 1735 patent mentions them already being here in like 1722, but only a few, not a whole lot. But then the numbers increased. When you're saying, Nancy saying, coming up from Pennsylvania, um, some of them can either maybe came through Philadelphia or came from New York, through New York. But then, I don't know, Nancy, Kelly, do you know anything about a later migration, like just at the time of the revolution, 1770-ish, where um, Palatine families were coming from Pennsylvania up into Orange County? And I have documents of them being in, in Pennsylvania, and I don't know why they left and why they came here at that later date. And then they went to the Poconos. They didn't stay, stayed for 10, 15 years, and then they moved on to the Poconos. And I think it had something to do with Lutheranism. Nancy, any response? Uh, well, just that I think that um, their, their opportunities in Pennsylvania weren't so great and they um, came to understand that there were better opportunities in New York State. At that later time or earlier? I guess in the 1730s. Mm. But this group came later. So I don't know why they, they, there seemed to be a migration in Pennsylvania where they were moving up into Northampton County, which then of course became divided up into smaller counties later, but they wound up in Wayne County. It, it sounds like there's uh, 
some additional research opportunities here. Um, it's, there's an infinite amount of research that could be done. There's plenty here for any graduate student, believe okay. me. <laughs> Just one, one other question, Will. I, I Regarding those ledgers that are at the State Archives, the DeWitt ledgers, those are not scanned. I mean, I, obviously you had to scan the selections that you spoke about this evening, but um, it, it seems that unlike in Dutchess County where you have put, I think you said 167,000 pages of the uh, court filings online for us, uh, you know, there, there doesn't, I, I, I think it's unfortunate, although I understand the state budget may not uh, permit it at this juncture, uh, but it would certainly be good if that, that kind of material could be more available to the public. In any event, I guess that's just an editorial comment on my part rather than a question. Uh, I see I see Dee Barrow has her finger up here. One, I'm one sorry. Go ahead. I'm Deborah Barrow, and um, I'm wondering if farther east in the town of Rhinebeck, along what was the Sapasco Trail, but is now Route 308, on the corner of Cedar Heights and Route 308, there is a Civil War era house that I believe was, was related to the Palatines in an earlier time. And when I moved here 40 years ago, there was this rumor of the Queen of Sapasco, and Nancy Kelly might remember what I'm talking about. Nancy lives not far away from- I, I know she does. And I'd have to defer to the town historian on that one. That's beyond the scope of my research. The house she's speaking of is one that uh, my family owned for 125 years. Um, Prior to that, the families that owned the the um, area, there were Palatine families, and then prior to that, German, I mean uh, Dutch, so that Fredenberg was an original owner of the property, and then from there it descended to these others. And uh, actually my a grandfather who bought the property, his name was Weber, and that was the Palatine name, Weber. And Nancy, was the Ackerts a Palatine name too? I don't understand the question. In the same neighborhood, I own a property that was originally owned by the Lamoray and then the Ackerts. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Ackert was a Palatine name, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, I, Jeff, uh, do you see anyone else with questions? I don't see any other people indicating. Um, I just want to uh, reiterate that the books that Hank Jones has written, have such wonderful research about the various families. And uh, so he will have some information about the Wurttemberg families and about the original Palatines. And we should be sure to refer to them. And those are located in the Germantown library. Oh, yeah. Yes. There are, and thanks we to have, Nancy's generosity, there are copies that will be available at the Dutchess County Historical Society's mm -hmm. new location. And we do have some already at the Rhinebeck Historical Society. Okay. Well, I think we have had a great opportunity this evening to hear much more about a community that I think most of us don't realize uh, is as important to the history of Rhinebeck and had as much going on as we might otherwise have guessed. And Will, we have to thank you and uh, for the research you've done. Melody, for having called Will's attention to the presence of that particular resource that played an important part in his presentation this evening. 
uh, and we look forward to hearing more at some point in the future. Uh, so on behalf of the Rhinebeck Historical Society, thank you all very much for being with us this evening. Good night. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you, thank you Will.